Leanne, so go ahead and um, um, uh, yeah. take it from here. Great. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction, and I'm very happy to be here to share with you all uh, the chapter on negotiation. Um, and great to uh, meet uh, to and to meet people, folks who are SH um, in the SH community. Uh, I know uh, Grazia, you probably know. I've been to uh, Toulouse many times, and fan of. Uh, uh, CITAR too. I know CITAR when I was a master student, actually. Uh, great, great organization on intercultural communication. Um, and my, fra I, I, my degree, my PhD is from uh, Vanderbilt. Right. Uh, so I just went to visit a few weeks ago to see yeah. my professors there. Uh, big fan and also um, Chris is an old friend since I've been using um, GCI and IES for many, many years. Since I think 2011, when I went to get training from uh, at Reed College, that was a beautiful place and intercultural institute of uh, communication. And uh, also uh, friends with uh, Northeastern and Boston, also one of my favorite places to visit. Um, so let me share my screen. And it's been a great experience writing and joining the team to write this book. So um, disclaimer is that I have not used ISEGE. I, well, I have used ISEGE the very early version um, to debrief our honor students um, uh, here at Georgia State University, uh, but not recent. So my joining of the team is more on the qualitative side in the conceptual um, framework that we worked together in to write the, uh, I participated in a few chapters in writing this book. So um, this chapter that I'm, um, uh, I'm going to talk about today is on the, uh, the chapter on how uh, beyond silence, how context communicates in cross-cultural negotiation. And I touch on a little bit of conflict management. And of course, the chapter that Xiaoping will present later, uh, uh, incivility and conflict management. So I may touch a little bit on that, but my main focus is on the cross-cultural negotiation, how nonverbal communication um, impacts the, the negotiation dynamics and the process. Um, so here's a, the quote from Peter Drucker says, the art of negotiations is the art of hearing what is not said. So that fits the theme of uh, the book. Um, what we know is uh, from the current literature on cross-cultural negotiation is that uh, cultural values and verbal communication norms um, create challenges and barriers for negotiation and conflict managers. So, but then um, we, in this book, generally we bring a holistic consideration of communication um, into the conversation and we try to explore how the message relationship time and space domains of communication context um, can help us, can facilitate and standing, fostering uh, information exchange and quality communication relationship building. Um, basically, what are, given that the world is so polarized in today's world, how and standing nonverbal communication, um, these domains of communication can facilitate positive change for um, communication for relationship building. Um, since um, the earlier and the earlier conversations have already covered the um, the content, the definitions, so I will skip that. And most of 
uh, mostly focus on the applications of these ideas in uh, negotiation. Um, so, um, well, here are some examples, quick examples of um, um, how uh, cross-cultural negotiations happen. Um, I guess it's not, no one is um, unfamiliar with this kind of situations uh, between Ger this here's the situation between Germans and Spaniards. The Germans had a sleek presentation lasting 30 minutes with slides, graphs, diagrams, and video. The six Spanish managers facing them hardly watched the presentation at all. They were watching the salesman. Were these type of people they wanted to do business with? Did they like them after the session was over? The breathless Germans waited for the response. The Spaniards took them to lunch, which lasted till 4 p.m. After that, everybody took a siesta. The deal was done three days later. So you may think, well, this looks like cultural stereotypes, but um, this is pretty typical situation, actually, in international business that touches on um, multiple dimensions of the communication context, not only the message um, context of the presentation, um, the content of the, the message, uh, but also the relationships. So clearly the Spanish focus more on the type of people, the relationship, um, and then the time um, and space and in terms of when and how the deal is done, how the negotiation is finished. And these, I mean, the Germans are sp um, and Spaniards are on the same con content. They're not that far, far away from each other, but the, their negotiations can be impacted by the communication context. Um, the, here's another example. Um, Americans versus Japanese, um, in contrast to the results-oriented American model, it, the Japanese model declines to view the immediate issue in isolation, lays particular emphasis, uh, stress on long-term long and effective aspects of the relationship between the parties, is preoccupied with considerations of symbolism, status, and faith, and draws highly developed communication strategies for evading confrontation. So again, um, there are um, relationship, space, time, um, and um, the message type. So I guess um, this is not um, different from um, not unexpected for those of us who are familiar with cross-cultural communication and negotiation. Um, it just highlights the relevance of the four dimensions of uh, communication context. Um, so um, delving deeper into the message context, uh, which everyone have been reading our book or um, familiar with the definition is that it talks about your in interpretation of the message, the expression, and conflict management. Um, and that influence, like how we say, how we express the message influence the accuracy, significance, and authenticity that's being perceived. So how do we actually accurately perceive the message? My, my um, uh, the figure on the right um, talks about the holistic meaning of the Chinese verb to listen. So to listen in order to fully absorb the message that's being expressed by others, um, it actually involves not, it's not just a message go from one ear and go out from the other ear. It, instead, it involves the ear, 
um, you, um, the other party, eyes, heart, and I undivided attention. And also on the um, bottom here, king means you the respect to the other the other party. So um, I guess to understand the the message context in cross cultural negotiation. Um, we all know that good leaders and good negotiators are good listeners. So to listen means to um, fully pay attention and be mindful of the uh, message expression, um, the interpretation of the message, and also um, the con the confrontation styles of the other party. So only under these circumstances can we, after the listen, we can try to learn about the other party, plan our actions and act on the message that we um, understand in the situation. Um, so um, in uh, negotiations, of course, um, the message related to the message content, is also about the properties of uh, the language, um, people's accent, um, the gender uh, who are expressing um, these ideas can also make a difference in our perception, our interpretations of the message in um, negotiation. Um, so that's what the message context, um, I guess this is not so different from the other chapters, but the listening is really a highlight, um, super important aspect in cross-cultural negotiations. Um, any questions or comments so far about this? Um, okay. Um, so, because we're a small group, so please feel free to speak up or uh, if you have comments about any of the uh, content um, I'm talking about. And then um, the relationship context, um, I try, I guess I um, use a paper, use a framework uh, that I published earlier uh, with colleagues C.Y. Chu and Zhishe Zhang in 2021 um, in cross-cultural and strategic management. Um, the, again, in, um, especially in cross-cultural negotiations, um, misunderstanding, misinterpretation of communication often happens when we have different schemas, mental schemas about the relationship. And this hurt can hurt uh, trust building um, in negotiations. Um, so we know in the Western uh, world, uh, relationships are also talked about social capital that you can exchange, you can sell, you can, it's more on the transaction and the exchange side. And then the Chinese um, Eastern idea about guan xi, that is more um, communal side of uh, relationship. So we look at, so the metaphor, I guess the metaphors uh, for the exchange kind of uh, relationship or social network is like a fishnet. So the knots, the connections, they're more parallel and also, um, also um, there's no hierarchy. Uh, so it's easy for you to join the network and lose the, leave the network. There's hardly any uh, bad consequences because it's more based on the exchange side versus the communal, uh, the, 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 the metaphor, um, I'm sorry, I didn't have a photo for that, but the, the, our, there's a photo in our paper if you're interested, I'm happy to share. 
Um, the metaphor for the guanxi or the communal kind of uh, relationship network is like uh, the Chinese sociologist Fei Xiaotong. Um, he said the guanxi network is like you throw a stone in water, then the ripples, there's a, um, the ripples are closed circles, and then there's hierarchy the inner circles and the outer circles. And uh, it's a closed network, it's not open. Um, unlike our like LinkedIn network and someone invites you and you're easy to say yes. So, and then the dynamics of how these two types of networks uh, work in terms of the, the nature, how our perceptions of these relational mental models or relational schemas, um, they actually function differently. Um, so one is on, um, more focused on economic trans transaction, um, psychological versus a psychological investment with obligations and affinity. Um, the links um, like in the exchange network um, there are clear distinctions between personal and organizational or personal and I guess in the Western uh, Protestant um, professional network, um, there's clear distinctions between your personal uh, friend versus your professional friend. Yes, there may be overlaps, um, but there are clear distinctions versus in the communal network, um, your colleagues are your also your personal friends. Because um, I I remember when I was growing up in China, um, the apartments we stayed in are my parents' um, colleagues. So your personal, so your neighbors are also your colleagues. The children play together. So that that's not not a clear distinction between personal versus professional. And uh, the benefits in the social capital network is more on the access to resources and opportunities versus the communal network it gives you psychological safety, uh, affiliation, assurance to help when you need. Um, the um, so the, there's um, the cost, similarly, the cost of the um, social network, um, social capital kind of network is more on economic obligation and intentional maintenance for your uh, networks, like uh, um, in your, I guess, alumni networks. Um, those who are managing this kind of networks are uh, intentional in sending out uh, holiday cards or um, updates so your professional network keeps going uh, versus in the communal kind of social network, um, there's this emotional burden related to um, st stability of the network, your membership and long-term obligations. Um, they're almost, they're very loose kind of uh, um, uh, monitoring of the network in the exchange kind of, kind of networks versus uh, in the communal network. They are, because of the hierarchy, there are compliances and gatekeepers um, in those kind of networks. Um, consequences of withdrawal, uh, is minimum in the exchange network uh, versus in the communal network, there's spillover effects and expensive to of re-entry. I guess an example, well, um, an example would be, uh, well, some um, children of family, family business, they leave the family business and to become an artist maybe there are um, the obligations of would be expensive to um, re-enter the network, the family network. Um, 
and then the renew and expansion of the networks are um, uh, pretty open in the exchange kind of social networks versus in the communal kind of networks. Um, it's hard to, it's um, that I guess the Chinese saying is you should not let the fertile water flow outside of your rice field. So it's more likely to be internal breed kind of network. But then again, these two kinds of uh, social networks are not only the exchange kind of networks are not purely Western. The communal networks are not purely Eastern. I guess it, like here in the US or in Europe, um, they're exclusive kind of alumni networks or the country clubs. Um, they may be tend to become the kind of the communal kind of networks because they are quite close and exclusive uh, versus in Eastern world, um, in especially com the more commercialized uh, professional networks, they will become more like the exchange kind of networks. So, um, so I guess these are kind of the relational schemas of how uh, that's behind the relationship uh, domain of communication context. That can apply again, have implications for, um, for the um, cross-cultural negotiation because when we have different expectations and different mindset, about the relationship coming to a negotiation, um, it may cause clashes and misunderstandings and miscommunication um, in uh, negotiations or when we're trying to resolve conflicts. Um, so, um, so this is this is the idea of how the uh, relationship context. Uh, can potentially have an impact on negotiation and conflict management. Um, we have a recent uh, paper also published in 21 um, that we compare Chinese and Americans in negotiations. We find that, well, both Chinese and Americans negotiators, um, they think, well, the salient features in negotiation our cooperation and competition. Um, but um, the Americans more focus, focus more on the economic exchange, economic interests and uh, um, open communication. But Chinese focus more on the hierarchies of the relationship. Who is speaking? Who sits where? So the status and hierarchies and seem to be a more salient feature when we ask the, about the professional uh, negotiators and what are the important issues for them. So, um, so this is another, this is the, how the relationship context might influence um, negotiation, cross-cultural negotiation. And then um, the time context and the sensory and space context. So for time, um, I guess we are uh, all familiar with the short-term versus long-term orientation, um, the arrival time, that signal status, um, the timing of the offer and counter offer. Um, that's when we when we teach cross cultural negotiation. I often say, well, negotiation is in both an art and science. Um, the artistic side of negotiation is really to sense if you have the right, if that's the right time for you to, uh, to make an offer or, and, or accept an offer. Um, and then the, um, there's the, the metaphors of uh, time, it is time is money versus time is actually a train, a journey uh, that applies in negotiation. Um, I, I know one of our co-authors, Wendy Adair, she wrote about negotiation, the rhythm 
uh, the negotiation dance, like different stages of negotiation, the interactions are different and uh, our time schemas will be different. Um, I guess one example uh, was um, in, at the end of the Clinton administration, uh, there was a Camp, Camp David uh, negotiation between Yasser Arafat and uh, uh, the Israeli and Isaac Rabin on the Middle East um, peace treaty. Um, at the time, um, Yasser Arafat said, well, thinks he could have pushed more for an agreement. Uh, but now in hindsight, uh, I think historians think, well, that was the best possible deal uh, that for a Palestine state um, at that time. But he didn't, at the time, Yasser Arafat didn't think he thought he could have pushed for more. He could have got more for his side. So he did not agree on that agreement. Um, so now we all see what happens, the aftermath. So the timing of reaching and agreeing to an, um, a deal is really tricky and hard, but for us um, training professionals and uh, training our students to learn about how what how to look at the timing in negotiation and conflict management i guess it's for us to um a lot of the cases they to hone our own artistic edge to sense if we had enough um and then the um negotiation access um analysis and professional training is about we compare our best, our best alternatives to a negotiated agreement. So if the current deal is good enough for us, and even it's not the most ideal, the most optimal, maybe it's, maybe it's a good opportunity to, to reach an agreement. But again, it depends on the situation, depends on the context, like when, uh, when you agree or when you propose an offer, um, that's um, still a very interesting, uh, very um, individualized decision on the timing in negotiation. Um, so, and then the sensory and the space context in negotiation. Uh, so this figure, it shows that between uh, US and the, uh, um, Japan, like where depends on the gender of the other party, where do you feel uh, comfortable of being touching and in, um, um, inter, uh, in being, being touched and you feel comfortable to greet? Um, I'm sure, so the date shows this is 1975, so certainly before the Me Too movement uh, worldwide. Uh, but it, again, it shows how we feel about um, the sensory styles um, in negotiation um, in intercultural interactions. Um, and then the other related issues of our voice interruption, um, silence, how do you feel about um, the silence from the other party and in, during the process of negotiation, um, the seating, um, I say shape of the table um, is there's the example um, about the peace, again, a peace negotiation at the end of the Vietnam War. Um, it, the Americans and the Vietnamese were negotiating in Paris. So again, the location, the space is um, for peace treaty matters. So um, during that negotiation, you can imagine that three governmental uh, delegates um, in that, um, or negotiating the uh, the peace treaty, but during that negotiation, the Vietnamese keep saying, um, insisting that they want to change the table, the shape of the table. Um, they, I guess, they first have a round table. The Vietnamese say, "Well, this is not right. Let's change to a long table." 
when they change to a long table, they think, well, this is not correct and we should change to an oval shaped table. Um, so uh, so the, the issue at the, um, is at the table is not really about the shape of the table. Um, later on, we find that it's because there's a presidential election going on in the US. Um, the Vietnamese wanted to wait more to see which party is getting ahead and how which party who are the true decision makers later after the election. So that will make, have different, um, probably more favorable um, um, clauses for conditions for them. So again, this is the issue is not about the shape of the table, although that seems to be a space issue, uh, but it's about doing their due diligence and doing their homework about the other party of understanding the other party um, so that they can impact the outcome of the negotiation. Um, so that's the sort of the shape of the table. It, it related to um, the sensory style. I know in some um, um, some negotiations about um, iron ores, um, minerals, and sometimes like the um, in um, Africa when people are negotiating the cobalt. Um, one party would come with a piece of the mineral to the table, bring it to the negotiation so that people can, the other party can feel how precious and how the mineral actually feels like to make it so real that will trigger some emotional connections um, in the to the other parties so that potentially make them more agreeable or make them likely to um to um uh, make certain decisions about that. Um, we in our study about the sensory styles, um, there's also so we know um, this is again not new, but like all marketing strategies. Uh, use our sensory uh, styles to try to stimulate a certain uh, mood. Because like some hotels, you go into the lobby and some stores, there are certain sm smell that can trigger your thinking and put you in a certain uh, mood. Um, in the WeWorks, um, the shared workspaces, um, there's a New Yorker article talk about um, how they sync the music that plays in different locations so that people in different locations but on the same call or trying to collaborate can be put in the same um, state of mood um, so that they can that can trigger and facilitate um, uh, emotional expressions and how they feel about each other in the collaboration. So, um, so this is how um, we in the book we talk about the um, these um, context of communication can influence negotiation, collaboration, and uh, um, potentially um, decision making in negotiation. So with that, we propose these um, propositions in the book um, about message we say in cross-cultural interactions, engaged listening and contextualized uh, persuasion strategies that tune to both the explicit and implicit verbal and emotional expressions by other party can facilitate mutual understanding of interests and strategies. Um, about the relationship context, um, we talk about the perceptions of the relationship context by negotiators and disputants in cross-cultural settings can vary and change depending on the type of relationship and their centrality in the most salient network. Um, which I talked about the communal versus the exchange networks. Um, the more negotiators and 
uh, conflict disputants actively adjust and manage the relationship context with their, the other party, the more likely they'll be able to build shared and standing rich mutual, um, be mutually beneficial outcomes. Um, about so time, the time context again is about um, for being proactive and mutual adjustment of time orientations that can facilitate event planning, scheduling, task uh, structure, the deadlines, and reduce potentially reduce and missed and standing in the uh, and related to the temporal cues. Um, for the space and sensory styles, uh, we propose that the more negotiators conduct due diligence in cross-cultural interactions related to the space context that um, involve extending nonverbal cues, um, planned situational setting, um, the more they can clearly signal prudent deliberation and respect of the other party. Um, so that's the um, proposition. So in some of my current projects um, in teaching and working with um, these different government non nonprofits and uh, um, companies, and also in our study abroad programs and virtual exchange partners. So we try to apply these ideas um, in our intercultural uh, communication, negotiation and conflict management projects. Um, and then just to conclude, um, I want to say that given the grand challenges of today um, and tomorrow with war and peace and the uh, technology, um, climate, water, uh, food, and uh, mobility of people. Um, communication and standing the communication context um, can potentially facilitate uh, interdisciplinary consensus and uh, solutions that help us resolve conflicts um, and pot potentially uh, facilitate the development of uh, the sustainability development goals and uh, um, collab potentially collaboration among multiple parties. So um, that's all I have to share and want to hear your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Leon. That was really great. Um, oh, it looks like we do have a hand up. Um, uh, Razia, yes. Yes, hi. Uh, I found your presentation really extremely relevant, interesting. And I wanted to make a comment in relation to what you said about the relevance of time in uh, considering time in um, conflict management. I was uh, recently in a situation where um, Ukrainians didn't want to sit <laughs> at a conference next to Russians and mm -hmm. were very unwilling uh, about talking uh, about how we could possibly throw intercultural bridges <laughs> between mm -hmm. um, Russians and uh, Ukrainians or rather the opposite. And these people were saying, so these Ukrainians were saying it's outraging that uh, interculturalists should propose this to us at the, at, the, at the time being. We're certainly wanting to build walls, not bridges, yeah? Mm -hmm. Which, of course, interculturalists were not living a war situation. We're finding very puzzling because that is what interculturalists are supposed to be doing. However, it is very true that the time frame is important. So. The per same person said that as yes, maybe in 15, 20 years time, maybe my uh, my family in the future will be able to do that. Now, at the moment, we are not able to even talk about that. So in conflict management, sometimes the time frame might be extremely long as well. Yeah. So now, yeah. of course, I hope that for the Ukrainian war, uh, Russia and Ukrainian war situation, mm -hmm. It might not be as long, but definitely the time frame is extremely important. Yeah, thank yes. you. Yes, thank you. I mean, a lot of the current conflicts in the world 
have long historical origins. And some people, yes, in, when we teach negotiation conflict management, we want to say, okay, we want, we want to propose future-oriented solutions. But, but people, it's very difficult for people to forget history, to forget what happened many generations ago, what happened to their ancestors. Um, so that's both, of course, that's um, related to the perception of power and fairness in resolving conflicts. Can current generations help um, or move forward from historical hatred to move forward to, toward the future? So that's the a huge um, uh, problem in the conflict that we're trying to uh, work on today too. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Others? Yes. Thank you very much. And I think that the presentation was very, very uh, relevant. And, and um, I think that I, I like to uh, read a book uh, more. Uh, and you. I'm really, you know, appreciate that the, you, uh, you know, putting forward with all the uh, nonverbal uh, contextual um, communication importance uh, to consider, especially that the uh, when you are talking about the you know social capital versus that the uh, um, you know the relationship um, that cannot be really um, it it speaks a volume if when really uh, need to have the uh, potential interdisciplinary consensus mm -hmm. um, the yeah. side of the um, you know the social capital exchange to see relationship as exchange tend to um, kind of see uh, not being able to see the weight of those rituals or that the uh, space of those things and but that is really make such a difference in the relationship building and the trust um, building as well mm -hmm. so and funny thing is that the Grazia talking about the um you know, the current versus the, the in the future. Um, but um, I had an um, opportunity to attend to the um, some event in the Portsmouth, New Hampshire uh, to commemorate the, um, after the um, Japan-Russia war, um, which is, uh, I don't know, a long, long time ago, and there was a treaty was uh, signed in Portsmouth, New Hampshire by Japan and then Russia. And so that was, I don't know, 50 years or no, 75 years or more, 100 years uh, com uh, commemoration. But still that the um, Japan side um, coming from the official uh, Japan delegation from the consulate uh, mm -hmm. told uh, us, the group from the educational exchange uh, people, don't talk to the Russians. Mm -hmm. So that, that they, they are still have the official capacity to have the certain um, animosity or that the uh, blockage. And I thought after so many years, um, isn't it the good opportunity to have a little bit more, more guard down and then to, to have a frank you know, the communication, but unfortunately that there was no facilitator or negotiator in per se to be able to, um, you know, uh, lay the ground. And yeah. that was, uh, I felt like this is a, another lost opportunity to really understand each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you brought a very important question about the level of analysis of our relationships. So sometimes uh, people think um, we are individuals are representing the country. Of course, for diplomats and officials, they do represent their country, but it's the personal relationship that build bridges that can break barriers uh, to move forward. But it's really difficult to separate um, the personal from the the collective levels of relationship. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
and Patricia is new to the session. And Chris and Mafra, any comments? Um, when you were going over the table of the, the relationship building, it reminded me of a client that I, I worked with years ago. Uh, it was a um, resort company, U.S.-based resort company that had international locations, and they wanted to open a branch in, in Asia, and we were to help coach their team to, to be effective global leaders. And um, there was one person who just scored pitifully on every evaluation and interview, and I couldn't figure out why this person was on the team. And I finally pulled them aside, and, I, and this person was put in charge of government relations, which in my mind, very Western construct, meant the ability to flow freely in and out of the, the Chinese bureaucracy and of this, this agency uh, resort and, and kind of explain and make friends and help things move forward. Um, and, and this person showed no friendliness <laughs> that I could discern. And, and they finally pulled me aside and says, her father is the local party chairman. Oh, she's there for a reason. Yeah, it is her. It is is the status that she carries, and and the familiar relationship status that she she brings that assures that your your resort will open and will function and not get closed on Tuesday. Because mm -hmm. you will, and it was like okay, yeah. <laughs> but you know, from <laughs> from looking at the things that that we frequently look at, you know, up to it, including communication style is kind of like, I don't see how this is going to work. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. that it was, was fun. Fantastic <laughs> example. Mm, great work. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just thank you. That was very um, thought provoking. Very interesting. I, I, I really liked looking at how the Chinese verb to listen was broken down and to be aware of how different people in are listening, not just be um, working on my own personal skills to be able to listen in many different ways to what's said and not said, but also how the other people in the room may be listening. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mafra. Great. Um... Grazia. Has another question? Oh, Grazia. Yes, I just have a, both a question, a comment, and a question. So uh, it is well known that even in a in an online context, we we have to pay attention to uh, the we could say the speaking terms, so to say the hierarchy. Sometimes mm -hmm. even the arrangement, of the um, how do you call them, the videos. So the um, who is appearing uh, first, and uh, how we pin the various. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, the videos of the speakers and so on. Um, do you have any particular pieces of advice uh, in relation, for instance, to you were talking about the Chinese? Yes. And so any pieces of advice in relation to that? Um, I think we, we have a chapter that Nancy, um, virtual communication, how these four domains of context influence virtual communications. I guess it's um, extra because it's a linear communication for the online situation, it's more uh, we have to pay extra attention to the um, nonverbal side of communication in the online world because we're only two dimensional in the square. Um, that's um, just additional challenging. And then the images, the backgrounds and emojis and words um, and what we project our image in the online world, I guess just add additional layer for interpretation and, and standing. Um, I don't know, I think I'm sure Jeff has scheduled another, the Nancy's chapter um, to discuss more about the virtual communication. Uh, yes, we've actually had that session already, which is on the YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to be sending everyone a, a link in, after this session, a link, not only a link to this recording, but to our YouTube channel, which has the past 
uh, sessions. Um, I think maybe one thing in relation to what you're saying, though, Grazia, is we did some research at the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, virtual communication, uh, studying um, Chinese and U.S. managers. Um, and one thing we noticed is that the Chinese managers were able to build teamwork a lot better um, through virtual uh, communications as opposed to the American managers. Um, and there's some discussion around why that is, um, you know, were they sort of paying a lot more attention? Did they have their screen on more often? Were they paying more attention to nonverbal cues in this little box? Um, or was it just that um, uh, community was so important uh, in that, more, more important in that situation um, in that it didn't quite drop off, um, the, the sort of teamwork didn't quite drop off as much. Um, and that's a, maybe a paper I can share. Um, it's not a paper, it's a, a, a small piece um, with some data that we collected. Thank you, yes. Um, so I wanna remind everyone, uh, there will be no uh, Lunch and Learn in August, unfortunately. Um, September 6th is our next session. Um, and then October 11th, the second uh, Friday of each month. Um, and hopefully by then we will come up with a new format to continue this going. Um, uh, after October. Um, we want to appreciate, uh, and once again, August, uh, we have training. Um, if you are a certified trainer or would like to refresh um, uh, sort of your, uh, um, how the tool works and so forth, you're welcome to join that session. Um, otherwise, um, you'll be hearing from me on email with a, with a link to the recording. Um, uh, any other questions, um, I'm going to hang out here for a few moments. Um, but I am going to end the recording here. I can figure out how, here we go.